Good morning, good morning. How are we doing this morning? Good? Just good? Just good. Just good. Marcus says we're good. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. Uh, have you noticed the pastor isn't here? I don't know if he said anything, but um, Miss Fishburne's uh, church where she had her, her former pastor uh, passed away a couple weeks ago. His son now took over that church, or took over that church, and asked pastor if he would do kind of like a like like a like a charge or ceremony. Um, I was a little confused. He said the best thing I could describe it is kind of like when you get ordained, uh, when you when you kind of take an oath. They tell you, okay, church, you have this job to do, and pastor, you have this job to do. That's kind of what pastor's doing today. So he's out there in Pennsylvania. He'll be back. Um, I think he said Tuesday afternoon. Uh, so if you need anything, again, of course, you know, you can always call him if you need something. Uh, you can always call me as well. So all right, so please stand. We'll take our songbooks and sing a couple of songs. Turn with me in your songbook. Uh, getting into, this is September the 3rd, of, uh, the first Sunday of the month. So we have a new chorus of the month. And it is Every Day with Jesus, number 254. We'll sing that through twice this morning like we normally do the courses. And we'll go on to our next song. 254 in your songbook. a smartphone that has a dumb owner. I mashed it in my bed liner like a week or so ago. Sandy and I went to Verizon and they fixed it. But it's doing a lot of this morning. So if it goes off, I have no control on it because it won't even let me shut it off, which I normally do on Sunday. So it's having a mind of its own this morning. I think the devil's possessed it and it wants to go off there in church. So uh, I must, I'm going to have to buy like a hundred pizzas because in the middle of that song, an alarm was going off. So, yeah, it's like it's trying to go off now, and I can't do anything for it. So uh, just pray for me that the thing lets us get through the service. Number 102 in your songbook. 102 in your songbook. I stand amazed in the presence.
You know, every time I hear a song like that or sing a song like that about Jesus being in the garden, I always think of Judas. What the bloods came down, the thing, the very thing that could save Judas' soul, G- Judas kissed. And it tends to break my heart sometimes to think about it that way. But you know, when he sat there and deceived Jesus there in the garden, and after Jesus was praying, he had he was so intent on praying, he had those sweat drops of blood run down his face and Judas kissed the very thing that could have saved him. Sometimes he gets heartbroken when you try to witness to people and you see how close they are and they just tend not to want to want to submit. But let's pray though. Father, we thank you, Lord, for those sweat drops of blood. We thank you, Father, for what you did for us on the cross. If it wasn't for what you did for us on the cross, we wouldn't be able to get saved. And we thank you, Lord Jesus, for being humble enough to to submit to God's will, to be able to do what you did. And we thank you so much. Thank you so much. And we thank you now, Father, for just leading us and guiding us today. Lord, I pray that you be with pastors away from us. Keep him safe. Lord, give him lots of wisdom. And pray, Father, that you bless the service that he's in there and bless the new church and the pastor. And I pray also, Father, that you bless everything you see and do here. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, before you're seated, give somebody a big smile with a big handshake. Make your way back to your seats. We got a couple of very important announcements, a couple of events coming up that are pretty big to the church and things we want to uh, make sure we really work hard on to, to help pastor. And again, you know, you can always show your appreciation to preacher when you bring guests and bring as many as you can. You, know, you don't have to know them. Just find some guy off the street. I did that in Chicago a lot. I'd make deals with uh, some of the homeless on Chicago. I say, if you come to church, I'll buy you food afterward. So if you find any of those people, it's just, you know, hey, it's a free meal. Well, not, not really. I mean, I, I did what I did, and, and they came. People heard the gospel. They got fed. We were good. So we have that coming up. We have September 17th. So, of course, we have the invitations in the bulletins as well as on the back pew there. Go ahead and hand out as many as you can in the next two weeks. Um, what a blessing it would be to have to print out more because we just handed them all out. That would be great. It's also an extension of our uh, track club. So we'll be having that meeting here in a couple weeks as well. Uh, we don't have that on our uh, bulletin, but that'll be uh, the week following Friends Day. So we have, of course, 6 o'clock evening service tonight. Uh, Pastor will not be talking about Joshua. If he is, I'd be a little worried. So, yeah, we had that little bit of bulletin there. Pastor won't be here tonight, of course. We have our institute on Friday or on Tuesday. We'll be here at 6. We'll start at 6 again. Uh, so far, it's been going really well. And again, um, if anybody would like to join us for one afternoon to see what it's like, just let me know so we can make the preparations for you for, for food and things and, and to make sure we have everything accommodating for you, seats and everything. So if you want to come and check it out, uh, uh, you know, you have basically you, you'll get like one free, one free setting, uh, which is okay, just to see what it's like for you. 
uh, more than welcome to join us next semester. So then we have our rally on the 9th, Saturday morning. Okay, it's going to be an all-day thing, an all-all-day thing. So it starts at 10 o'clock, girls, and Josh and Zach, 7 to 10 o'clock, Saturday morning. So we have to leave here at 9, so pickups will be at 8. Donuts are provided between 9.30 and 10 if we get there quick enough, uh, which I intend to try to be, and we'll be there till probably about 3 o'clock. Then we'll be on the way home, so plan on being out for 5. I'll try to have a sign-up sheet, or not sign-up sheet, but a uh, permission slip for everybody that will have to come back signed. So that way I know that your parents looked at them. So that way I don't get calls, what time you going to be home, what day it was. I already had three calls last Friday. Do you have a teen activity tonight? No. No, not on Friday. So we'll get that all squared away for you. Uh, this coming Sunday on the 10th, we've got Gideon's International, uh, which they're going to come and give us an update. And then also uh, we have Miller's. Um, if you could, if there's anybody that might be able to help out with Miller's on Sunday, Brother George might not be here. Uh, we would like not to cancel, uh, if possible, uh, but we will if we need to. Um, if there's someone that might be able to fill in that Sunday, please let Brother George know. Uh, if not, we will go ahead and cancel, which is which is okay. Um, we don't like to. So, you know, we have two Sundays out of the month, so they'll still still get a dose of us, and they get the teenagers next. So Brother George kind of prepares them for the teenagers to come in a couple of weeks. So we'll see. Uh, there you go. Jo jo Brother George says he'll put him to sleep. We'll wake him up. So that's on the 10th. Uh, again, if anybody's interested, let us know, and we'll uh, make preparations for you on there. Then, of course, Friend Day. And you can see all the times. You know, we have All the times are going to be the same. We have the music from uh, the Crosswalk Quartet. Or no, 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 it's not the. It's Crosswalk Quartet because there was a the, wasn't there? There is a the Crosswalk Quartet. And then there's just crosswalk quartets. So we have to make, make sure we make that known. And then, of course, we have the dinner afterwards. The sign-up sheet are on the back. So go ahead and fill up those. Uh, the church is providing meat. So everybody else, if you can just bring sides, salads, uh, desserts, things like that. Uh, just for Zach, my mother will be here, and she will bring two pans of brownies that you will not get any of. So, And then on the 20th, we have Kids Club. We have Kids Club on the 20th. All right. Uh, was there any other announcements that I might have missed that anybody might uh, needed to uh, get them all? All right, of course, always be in prayer for preacher. Uh, Brother George, uh, if you could come and do prayers for us. Um, I do have one, uh, one prayer request, and I'll explain it. Uh, Miss Jennifer has family down in Poplarville, Mississippi. Uh, a couple weeks ago when the hurricane hit, we saw a video on Facebook.
you guys miss out on blessings of the conversations we have up here, and, and Pastor Rex knows what I'm talking about. The, the conversations that, that you have on a platform, maybe while the song's played or while something's going on, they're really deep theological conversations. Are like, oh, yeah, yeah. That's just, you learn some stuff up there that you just don't get anywhere else. So, so, so this, but we were having a little chuckle this morning about, uh, you ever, and, and I can say this and not, you know, won't pull the whole situation, but we were having a discussion this morning. You ever notice the people that have money or the people that don't spend money and the people that don't have any money are the ones that spend it all? And that was our conversation this morning. So, yeah, that's, and there's a lot of truth to that. And, uh, you, you know, the Bible teaches us to be good servants of what the Lord gives us and to be a good steward. We should make really good decisions, and that's what, that's what that was all about. Take your songbooks this morning. Turn to number 369 in your songbook. Number 369, Springs of Living Water. And, uh, you going, yeah, yeah, we got a junior church this morning. Miss Sandy's going to do. You're going to be down in the in-room in hall. Don't run, don't run, don't run. And uh, she'll take you down there, and you guys have a good junior church, and we'll stay here and get ready for Pastor Rich. 369 in your songbook. Stand with me as we sing Springs of Living Water. We'll sing just the first and last verse here of number 369. singing today and I want to say before Pastor Rich comes up here that you know some things in life oh you can be seated uh, sometimes in life the Lord answers your prayers and you don't even realize how he answered your prayers I was struggling about oh, what did it say, maybe 10 years ago 12 years ago maybe even longer now of keeping a constant soul in partner and I think a lot of it was the area that I had, maybe, or just different things that was going on. Well, on a Saturday morning one time, this young kid, young kid, young kid, he was good looking then, too. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, showed up on a Saturday morning at uh, Open Bible Baptist Church, where I used to attend. And we always went soul in there from 1030 to about 2 o'clock, sometimes later. And they were going to go soul in. I think they were here visiting family in Mishawaka, correct? Or were you here visiting somebody? Oh, okay. Yeah, they were here visiting the Backs, which Backs are a missionary family of ours now. And uh, he went out soul winning with me on a really, really cold January morning. I think it was about 20, 21 degrees. And he had the luck and fortune of going soul winning with me for two and a half, almost three hours on the east side of Wall Sea Lake. Wind blowing out of the west, very cold. And let me tell you, you find the character of a man that'll stay with you for two and a half, three hours. Because I was on a mission. We had a little contest going on there where you got so many points to win a pizza if you knocked on so many doors on during soul winning time. You know, to get everybody. So I made sure we locked, because he was a Bible student, you know, went to college, so I was going to show him up that day. You know, and I think we both broke. I think we both broke. We had a great time. Uh, we, met, uh, we, met the, we met the Rouse then. We kind of stayed in contact. He went on to... Uh, graduated Hiles Anderson, went on down to Albuquerque, New Mexico, and was an assistant pastor down there. And then later on, he moved back up this way and came over there and served under uh, Pastor Carnes like I did for a few years. And Sandy and I were praying about workers in the church and needing some help and wanting some people in the church here that we didn't necessarily have to train or pastor didn't train or didn't come with a whole load of baggage that we had to figure out before we could get them to serve here in the church. 
And lo and behold, we pull in the parking lot one Sunday morning, and guess who's in the parking lot? Rich and Jennifer Rao. And Sandy looked at me, and I looked at her, and I said, I wonder what they're doing here. And Sandy says, you've been praying for workers. Maybe the Lord's answering your prayer. And Rich and Jennifer have been an answer to my prayer ever since I came here. So I want you to take your Bibles out this morning and listen to what the Lord's put on Brother Rich's heart and understand that he's an answered prayer to this church. Man, thank you for that, Brother George. Again, he tells that story like I remember it. The only thing I remember is frozen toes. I had uh, dress shoes on and only had one thin pair of socks. Uh, I was not expecting to be out for three hours. Uh, so you can ask my wife. I came home very frozen that day. That's all I remember is my recovery. But I do remember going out. And it's always a blessing to go out so late. Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1. And I also want to uh, extend also a thanks uh, to you. Uh, in times like this, you know, it, it's always a privilege. And it does my heart good all the time to know that, you know, even though pastor's not here, and we might have a guest speaker or assistant or Brother George or somebody, that you're still here. And that's, that's really important to preacher to know that his people love him that much that they're going to come to church. And, and it shows, and not only does it show more of, of your love for God than it does for man, you're not following preacher. So when preacher's not here, you're not here, but you love God enough to know that I'm here because I'm supposed to be here. And that's really important to preacher. That I, I know that, that this thrills his soul. And, and also to know that there's not going to be a mutiny or anything going on while he's gone. You know, we also heard of the whole, the whole stage debacle uh, before Preacher got here. You know, and there's been many other situations where, and in other churches where that has been. The Preacher went away for a week and on vacation or a furlough or whatever, and the next thing you know, he comes back to an upside down church. And I'm just so glad to know that that's not here. I just want to thank you for that. And it, and, uh, it, it is a privilege to come up here and to preach and, and to have the confidence of my Preacher to, to know that when he's gone, things will still be taken care of and it'll be business as usual. So we'll start in Mark chapter 1. We're going to read several verses. Uh, we've got uh, a little bit of a message here. Uh, and I was so excited about this message only because, uh, you know, preacher has all these alliterated messages all the time. He's got all these words that match and all the letters that are same. It just impresses me. And I can never do it. You know, when we were talking about in Sunday school class how how Miss Dina would would look over Pastor Rex's um, uh, messages just for spelling, and you know, Brother George said, you know, same thing. I said, but I can get Sandy to type. Uh, I'd be good to go. Uh, but I, I, I did it. I had my wife type out some of my messages from time to time as she would correct them. That was, of course, while I was in Bible college, and I only have about eight hours a week to do schoolwork, messages, um, work. Uh, Stay current with your, you know, on, on your, uh, uh, do your devotions and things. So she was a real big blessing. So Brother George is what you got to do. Go to Bible college. You can have Miss Sandy type out your message. It's what you missed. It's what you missed. So here in Mark chapter 1, uh, we're going to look at uh, John Baptist for a minute. We got uh, uh, a little bit of a uh, character study here. Uh, and it's really cool how, how God has laid it out already. I mean, pretty much you read the words, you can see. The, the words that I'm going to use and, and the, uh, the alliteration is already there in the message. This is, it was really good for that. And I will say that Preacher has inspired me to have those. So here we go. Mark chapter 1, verse 1. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in the prophets, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his way. John did baptize in the wilderness and preached the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. And there went out unto him all the land of Judea and they of Jerusalem and were all baptized of him in the river of Jordan, confessing their sins. Verse 6. And John was clothed with camel's hair and with a girdle of skin about his loins, and did eat locusts and wild honey. 
and preach, saying, There cometh one mightier than I after me that latches of shoes, of whose shoes I am not worthy to stoop down and unloose. I indeed have baptized you in the water, but he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this, uh, for John Baptist and, and his ministry. We thank you, Father, for the Bible and the Word of God. We thank you for our church and for preacher. We just thank you, Lord Jesus. Uh, there's just so many things that uh, we take for granted uh, that oftentimes we don't think about. We thank you for life and for breath. And we just ask now, Father, that you will take this life and this breath and you'll convey your message. Use me as we preach this message, Lord Jesus. Open our hearts to the Word of God. Amen. So you saw there, in, in, in the message there, you saw a few words that, that uh, uh, kind of stood out. And so I took those words and thought about them a little bit. And uh, it was amazing how when you read the Bible, sometimes your outline already is prepared for you. You just got to do what God asks you to do. So for our first point, we're going to look at the messenger here for a minute. We're going to look at the me or message, I'm sorry, the message. In verse 1, it says, The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. The message, of course, we've talked about it several times this last year. We've started a track club. The message, of course, is the gospel, the good news. It's what John Baptist came to preach, the good news. Who was the good news? That was Christ. He came to tell everybody, he says, Look, there's a gentleman coming after me that we need to be ready for. And we find that here in, 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 the, in the passage here that um, there's also a couple of the things that he needed to do. You know, first we, we looked at the good news. We talked about the good news, uh, 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 you know, several times, like I said. You know, we can use, you know, like the Romans Road or 1 Corinthians 15 or uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4 and John 3, 16. You know, we can use the things that, that John had already used you know, it's pretty simple. Um, you know, God has laid out everything for us uh, in that. And the message is just simply salvation. There's one other thing that, that John also was talking about. You know, he was talking about the good news. He also talked about baptism. You know, it was interesting as I, as I thought about this, uh, thought about baptism. Uh, a couple of thoughts came to mind that I didn't realize before. You know, one of them was which, of course, baptism is a picture of salvation. It's a picture of the crucifixion of Christ. You know, as I was explaining to, um, to Jose last week, you know, when you take your hands and you make them uh, in, into the picture of a cross, you know, this, this is you have is the plane of water, if you've looked at that before. And then here you have Jose or whoever's getting baptized. And then once they get once they go below the water, that's also signifying the same thing as Christ being buried in the tomb. Then again, he was raised to walk in newness of life. So when we get baptized, it's a picture of the crucifixion. So when John was baptizing in the Jordan, he was showing everybody Isaiah 53, what Christ is going to have to go through. The things that we have to relate ourselves with, with Christ when we uh, die to ourselves as well. And it was also interesting to note that it wasn't until John Baptist came on the scene that there was actually physical water baptisms. And that was the thing that, that got to me before I, you know, I thought about it. You know, in the Old Testament, there really wasn't anybody that got baptized because you didn't need to be. There was a few people that dipped themselves in the water, you know, like Naaman, for example. We, uh, Pastor talked about Naaman a few weeks ago uh, in, in 1 Samuel there, or uh, 1 Kings rather. Or Second Kings, sorry, Second Kings, uh, chapter five. How he went into the water and he dipped himself uh, seven times and came out clean. You know, baptism is similar to that. You know, Naaman came out clean. That's what happens when we do the same thing. Now, baptism does not help us with our salvation. It doesn't make any difference whether we're baptized or not. It, it doesn't get us any closer to heaven, unless, of course, Pastor holds you underwater a little too long. But uh, uh, or, uh, but uh, for the most part, it doesn't really help us with our salvation. It's just another act, like a wedding ring, as we explained. And, you, and you've heard that illustration before. A wedding ring doesn't make me any more married than baptism makes me saved. And I got to thinking about 
you know, all those in the Old Testament didn't need to be baptized because the crucifixion hadn't happened yet. You know, Christ had not died yet. You know, in the Old Testament, they were looking to Christ. In the New Testament, they were looking back at Christ. And so as we get baptized, we take that step saying we are also identifying with Christ. And that's what baptism stood for. And so when, Paul, when John went through, he was showing everybody what was about to happen. Another illustration of the crucifixion of Christ. So we have the message there. We have the message of the good news. And we have the baptism. Secondly, we have the messenger. I'm going to spend a little few times of this. And the messenger, of course, uh, also needs to be worked on us here. It says, as it is written in the prophets, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. The voice of the one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. John did baptize in the wilderness and preach the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. You know, it was interesting how things work out. You know, uh, Brother George was talking about how we first met when we went uh, out soul winning. And, uh, and here we have something that we need to work on. You know, and, and one of the points he does say, and I'm not, I'm not bragging about myself, please don't think that. Uh, but it does take a little bit of character to get up and go soul winning on a regular basis. It's not normal for us to go tell people their rights and their wrongs. Typically, we want to just kind of stay away from everybody, and we don't uh, want to cause any controversy or stir up any strife. We just want to live our life and do what we have to do. But it throws kind of a wrench in the system when Christ says, hey, you got to go tell somebody about Christ. You know, one of the things I see here, and I see this word quite often, is prepare. One of the things we have to do as a messenger is we have to be prepared ourselves. We have to know, obviously, what the good news is. We have to be able to tell people and answer their questions. When they, answer, when they ask the question, well, what is that? We have to be able to explain it in a way that they can understand. And that's what John was able to do. And of course, the first step that we need to do in our preparation for being a messenger is we need to be saved. You know, John the Baptist was saved. Now, I know several people that, that have been able to go through, uh, you know, preacher's kids even, that... Um, have been able to witness to people and they genuinely got saved but they weren't saved themselves you know and sometimes it you know I've had that situation I, I'll give Josh as an example you know since he was able to walk since three years old he was handing out gospel tracts and he has witnessed to several people and a few of them have gotten saved but then just last year he said dad I'm, I'm not real sure if I'm saved or not I said, what makes you think you're not? I said, I don't know. I said, how about we just get it settled and be done with it? That sounds good. So we sat down, and we talked for probably a good half hour, hour there in his bedroom. And he did get gloriously saved, and he has a better understanding. And sometimes that's the case. I had one of my former pastors while I was in the military. His daughter was saved six times or baptized six times. And before she figured it out. You know, as long as you get it right before you die, that's all you got to worry about. That's the most important thing is to make sure you get it right sometime in your life. So in preparation to be a messenger, we need to be saved. The secondly, and probably the, one of the hardest, is to be separated and sanctified. Sometimes it's really hard to set yourself apart from the things that you've done, especially if you've been saved late in life. You know, you already have your routine, you already have your schedule, you already have things going on. You've lived this life already for 20, 25 years or however long it was. And these are the things that I do and I do it all the time. And I don't care what anybody tells me. Except for when you get saved. Then God says, okay, now you're mine. Now there's a list of rules and regulations that you should probably follow. Because if you don't, it makes it really hard to be that witness you know, we talked in Sunday school a couple weeks ago. A little pastor was talking about um, talking about being a, a, a good witness and having some of the fruits that we're talking about in Colossians there. And I made mention of a gentleman named uh, Mr. Kimmel. He uh, was one of my uh, teachers in, in uh, Bible college. And he gives us his illustration when he, uh, when he starts out uh, with, with his first class. He talks about he tried to witness to his brother. 
He said he took his brother. Uh, he says, you know, I'm going to do up a real nice night. And, you know, he wanted to try and make it a little bit flashy. So he says he took his brother to, uh, at that time, they were discos. So he went to the disco there and uh, uh, planned this whole hell night out, him and his wife. And then uh, his brother and his wife, they all went out and had a nice meal, a nice time. And, and he tells his wife, he says, all right, during this song, I'm going to take my brother out on the dance floor. I'm going to give him the gospel. And so they're out there dancing, cutting the rug, as he put it, and uh, uh, he, he witnessed to him, you know, over the music. And his brother looked at him and said, he goes, you know what? He says, you're wearing the same bell bottoms that I wear. He goes, yeah. He says, you got the same shoes on that I wear. He goes, yeah. He goes, you're listening to the same music I am. He goes, yeah, yeah, I'm here with you. And he goes, you're out here with me just like I am. He goes, yep. Yeah. He says, you're also smoking the same cigarettes that I do. He says, yeah. He says, why do I need Jesus? You're the same way I am. What makes the difference? You know, that really stumped, it really stumped Mr. Kimmel. He didn't know how to answer that question. He wasn't set apart. He wasn't sanctified. He wasn't separated. And oftentimes, that's kind of our little snag with us when we go to try to witness to people. We're not living the life that we need to live in order to be that example for them. We're not showing them there is something better than the way you're living because we're just living the same way that they are. You know, we need to be saved. We need to be separated. We also need to be sold out. We need to give it all to Jesus. And of course, that's what John, John had nothing. You see there in, chap, in verse 6 where it says, and John was clothed in, in camel's hair with uh, the girdle of skin about his loins, and he did eat locusts and wild honey. That was what he ate. That was his food. That was what he wore. He wasn't up here in nice duds and a suit and tie. He didn't have suit and ties. He didn't have a loin cloth. Jesus had that. He didn't have much. But what he did have is he had God. He had Jesus. He knew what he was designed to do. And he was all about it, and he wasn't going to stop until his mission was done. And that's exactly what he did. It wasn't a popular message. It wasn't the message that everybody liked to hear. Because it kind of got in your grill a little bit. Say, hey, you got to turn away from your evil, wicked ways. We'll get to this to a moment, but we know what happened to John Baptist. We're going to look at that in just a second. But in the end, you know, his, his message wasn't popular with the king either, or the king's wife. And he ended up paying dearly for it. But he was sold out. He was separated. Now let's turn to Revelation 3.16 real quick. It's a very, very popular verse, very familiar verse. This is the one that always gets us all the time. Revelation 3.16. Most of you know it well. You're probably already quoting it and thinking of it already. So then because thou art lukewarm... Neither cold nor hot, I will spew you out of my mouth. When you're not sold out, that's what happens to us. When we're not separated, we're not sanctified. That's what God says I'll do with you. And you're just kind of sitting there like a bump on a log. Yeah, I'm saved. Great, I'm saved. But you're not doing anything with it. God didn't save you just for you to not do anything with it. He has intentions for you to do something with it. And that's where being sold out comes in. And then serving our Savior. Right? Just like uh, we were talking about uh, uh, in the announcements, you know, there are several ways that we can serve in this church. And, and most of us here, of course, I understand I am preaching to the choir. Most of us are uh, serving as much as we can. And thank you for it. But that's one of the things that we're also called to do, is to be a servant. And how wonderful it is to serve. It's, it's, just, it, it, it's a wonderful feeling to be able to know that you helped somebody out. That you might have made a difference in their life. And that's what we're called to do. We're called to get saved. Then to be separated and to, se and to be sold out. We're also called to tell everybody else about why we are the way we are. Yeah, just like John, it's not a popular message. It's not going to be received well around here, no more than it was with John's days. Even now, with all the gadgets and gizmos and toys, it makes it even worse, I think. 
because when you start talking about Facebook and all the things you can, how gossiping you can do on Facebook and all the things on Facebook you get to see, it's not a popular message. So we see the message, we see the messenger, and part of the messenger is also being prepared so that you can be a preacher. So you can go out and you can tell everybody about that. Just look down at verse 7 and it says, well, let's start back at verse 6. And John was clothed with camel's hair and with a girdle of skin about his loins. And he did eat locusts and wild honey and preached, saying, There cometh one mightier than I after me that latcheth of whose shoes I am not worthy to stoop down and unloose. You know, John come to prepare the way for Christ. That's what we're designed also to do. We're also to get everybody prepared for heaven. To tell everybody else what Christ did for us in our lives. And we have to live a life in order to be useful for God. You know, just like Mr. Kimmel, uh, you know, if we're not living, if we're living a hypocrit hypocritical life, it's not going to be very effective. You know, and here John was found out in the wilderness and in a lot of cases, that's where some of us have to go through sometimes. You know, that's where he was found. And in most indications, I found that the wilderness also stands for judgment. You know, think of Moses after he, killed the, uh, after he killed the guard. He spent 40 years out in the wilderness, out there uh, getting prepared to come back to serve God. The children of Israel spent 40 years out in the wilderness where uh, well, they were also prepared because they disobeyed God. They didn't have the faith that they needed. And just like Paul was found on the back side of the desert, out in the wilderness on the road to Damascus, oftentimes that's where God will find us. Or that's where we need to go to be able to be prepared. And I think about this often. I don't, I don't talk about it much. Uh, you know, that's how God got a hold of me. You know, through my three deployments, the first time I was in Iraq, which is also interesting enough, it's also on the back side of the desert, I had uh, uh, went through a class, it was a, a Bible study with a couple of guys, and they uh, were talking about spiritual gifts. This is before, this is just when I got saved, I don't even think I was saved, maybe a year, just about a year. And uh, I had my first deployment, I volunteered so that another fella could stay home uh, with his family because his wife was supposed to have a baby you know, a couple months after he was deployed, but they said that if they were able to find somebody else, that could go. So I knew I had to go, so I volunteered. Little did I know, that was God's plan all along. Because once I got thinking about the spiritual gifts, you know, I kind of realized that you know, I, I wanted to know what mine were, and I kind of thought that uh, you know, I like to teach, I like to instruct, I like to do things, you know, baseball, uh, martial arts, you know, Bible things. I like to teach everything. I teach everybody everything. My fault is that I want to teach you all in one shot. But uh, uh, so I got to thinking about my spiritual gifts, and I came back and talked to my pastor about it. Uh, at that time, of Pastor Webster, God rest his soul, he's in heaven now. Uh, and you know, after I told him, you know, I thought I thought God was calling me to be a teacher. He looked at me with the probably the most serious, stern voice face that I think I've ever seen him have. He goes, are you sure God's not calling you to preach? I'm like, no, no, no. God couldn't be calling me to preach. I can't stand up in front of people and, and talk. But yet, you see the irony in it, though. I wanted to be a teacher, but I couldn't be a preacher. In some instances, it's one and the same. And so I got to thinking about that. He planted that seed, and then a couple weeks later, I got to ask him, and he says, well, how do you know you're being called to preach? He goes, well, you're going to have three people who are going to know. He says, you're going to know. I said, oh, good. I'm all right because I don't think I'm ready. I don't, I don't think that's what I'm going to do. He says, your wife's going to know. I was like, well, I don't know about that. And somebody else is going to know. And so I got deployed actually shortly after that. Interesting enough, probably five months after that. Five months after I got back, got back in December, left back again in May which is kind of an unusual thing. But because I volunteered out of my bucket, then they put me back in 
and I went back to Afghanistan. I went to Afghanistan this time. And I took a young man named Addison. Took him to uh, a couple of services while we were over there. And on the way to the one service one Sunday, we were probably there about a month, he asked me, he says, did you ever think about becoming a chaplain's assistant? I was like, mm, no. No, I didn't, but I took that as one of those situations where God was saying, you know, now there's somebody else that's asking you if you, you know, there's that one other person my preacher just told me about. I said, all right, so there's one out of three. So I got back, told my wife what happened, and I asked her what she thought. And, of course, her reply was, is, do you think you can be, do you think I can be a pastor's wife? I said, I think my wife can be anything. So I said, yeah. So now my wife knows. Somebody else told me, but I still wasn't convinced. So I still thought I was in the good. You know, if two out of three, you know, you have to have all three. And lo and behold, I got deployed again. Went back to Iraq and Afghanistan, or went back to Iraq, went to uh, Taji for about a month and went down to Key West. Taji is just south of uh, Baghdad, and that's when Baghdad was really bad. And uh, I went down to Key West, and while I was running, uh, you know, part of that PT thing about being in the military, your commanders, your commanders don't think it's funny when they say they need to get you in shape, and you say, well, preacher, well, sergeant, rounds of shape. They don't find that to be very funny. They tend to make you run more after you make that statement. And so we ended up running like three and a half miles, and I was not a family favorite in my squadron because of that. So when, while I was running on, running on the back side of the base there, I kind of realized, I was like, what? What am I struggling with? My pastor told me that uh, Pastor Rice, uh, he volunteered, so why don't you? So I said, yeah, why don't I just volunteer? There are people that believe in me and think I do, so I did. So there in the wilderness, the backside of the desert, just like so many others, that's what Christ had to do for me. Oftentimes, it's the same way for all of us as well. You know, there's a point in time in our lives where God will take you out of your comfort zone, and He'll make you, and He'll make you what you need to do. And the last thing we're going to look at here in this uh, part of the messenger is the persecution. Go ahead and look at. Uh, Chapter 1 here. And I have the verse. Oh, pull in a brother George. I lost my verse. Nope, nope, there it is. Verse 14. By persecution, being put in prison. Now, after that, John was put in prison. Jesus came unto Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. Now, like I said before, your message isn't going to be very popular and you're going to receive persecution. You know, after I told my father that I decided I was going to be a preacher, he wasn't very happy with me. For pretty much the next two or three years and even now, you know, every time I see him, I see this kind of disappointed look and I kind of feel that he's disappointed in me you know I don't know how many times he goes boy you were an operator you could go out and make hundreds of thousands of dollars operating equipment yeah yeah I could that's not what God called me to do he disappointed my father my family giving them the gospel came back from from the uh, desert and my sister calls me a fanatic I used to be really close with my sister very very close with my sister now we're eh, might speak to her once or twice a year used to be really close with her kids the, you know the separation the persecution that I've had with my family because I'm sold out and I know that many of you will probably face the same thing and it's tough it's tough when everybody that you knew, everybody that you grew up with, turns away from you. And here we see John was put in prison. Of course, later to only be beheaded. The persecution's out there, and it's going to happen. We just remember the verses that Christ said. 
says, if you're ashamed of me, I'm ashamed of you. So if you're afraid of persecution, maybe you're ashamed of Christ. And that might be something we need to, to take a look at. So we're going to go ahead and have Miss Judy. She's going to come and play for us for a minute. I'd like everybody to stand for a quick second. Brother George is going to come. He's going to lead us in a song here. But before we sing, I want to just take just a quick second to think about our preparation as a messenger, the things that we need to take care of in our lives. Let's go ahead and pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this opportunity. Thank you, Lord, for John Baptist as he's given us an example of what we're going to have to go through, what we need to do to be servants. And we ask, Father, that you look into our hearts as you help us, Lord Jesus to be able to be that messenger that you have called us to be. We ask, Father, that you help us, Lord Jesus, settle the things in our hearts that are keeping us from being that servant that you have called us to be. I pray, Father, that you help us, Lord, to do what we need to do to be able to get over that hump, to be able to move forward, to be a greater servant for you. With your head bows and your eyes closed. You know, we always give a salvation message. We always give an invitation. And I know that all of us here have heard this several times. But there's always an opportunity of uncertainty. Satan always gets in there and makes you uncertain. Now, if you have any doubts about your salvation, now would be the time to take care of it. And I'm wondering here now, most of us are saved. But I wonder what's holding you back. You say now, preacher, there is something. There is something I'd like prayer for. There's something that I need your help with. Please pray with me. Something that will keep me from serving Jesus like I'm supposed to serve. Please lift your hand now and I'll pray for you. Well, I'll pray for you. I see your hands all over the auditorium. I'm in the same boat with you. There are things that are holding me back from being what I need to be for Christ as well. So as the piano plays, Brother George come and lead us in a song. I'll meet y'all down here at the altar. I want to get it settled. I want to move farther along and be more for Christ. If you have a moment as we sing, come on down and meet me. I'll be down here praying with y'all as the piano plays. 